Hey, my name's Matt Kennedy, and this is the Steadfast Podcast. This podcast exists to use Bible study and theological teaching to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the Steadfast Podcast. I hope today's episode is an encouragement to you. Today on the Steadfast Podcast, we are picking back up with the story of Jesus. So in Luke's narrative, Jesus is now in the city of Jerusalem. Because God so loved the world, this is where Jesus would soon be arrested, falsely accused, tried, tortured, mocked, and crucified. This is the city his whole ministry has been working towards for a very particular and very powerful moment. His entrance into Jerusalem quickly led to a rambunctious start of the week. He went in the temple. He rebuked the corruption that he saw. He challenged us to not take the holiness of God lightly, but to take it seriously as it is such a powerful and wonderful thing. Today, we're going to pick back up with Luke chapter 20, verse 1 and following. But first, let's read our first point. God has faithfully demonstrated righteousness. God has faithfully demonstrated righteousness. Now, starting in verse 1, quote, One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who is it that gave you this authority? He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? End quote. Jesus has now driven out the people who made a prophet in the temple, and he has been teaching for some time now, and the people are hanging on every word that he says. Now, notice what he's teaching, or maybe I should say, notice what he is preaching. He is preaching the gospel, the good news. He is telling people the point of his presence there at all. Those who opposed him couldn't find any fault in Jesus because there was no fault to find. So they start questioning him. They ask, by what authority do you do all of this? Who put you in charge? Who gave you the right to make all these changes and teach all these things and declare all this authority? But Jesus responds to their question with a question. And his question reveals so very much. He asked about their view of John the Baptist. Now remember, John the Baptist said that his calling, his role in history, his role in the kingdom of God was to be a forerunner for the Messiah. He proclaimed the Messiah was about to come on the scene. He told people, you need to repent of your sins. You need to be baptized. He's coming. Wait a minute. He's actually here. So Jesus is asking this religious group of people, these leaders who are supposed to know stuff, he's asking John the Baptist, was the baptism that he was proclaiming, was it from heaven or was it from man? In other words, did God lead him to do this or did he make it up on his own accord? So now we have the scribes, the priests, and their whole group huddling together. So let's pick back up verses 5 through 8. Quote, And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. End quote. So these guys think that if they say John the Baptist only had the authority of someone who just made stuff up, man-made authority, if you will, then the people would riot. And what we see with this is that these people care so very much about the approval of the crowd. They want the people's approval. But on the other hand, if they say that John the Baptist's authority came from heaven, then that would really answer the question they asked Jesus. If John the Baptist's authority was from heaven, and he said Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, then Jesus' authority would also have been from heaven. It would have been wrapped up in the proclamations of John the Baptist. Remember, he said, Behold the Lamb of God when he was pointing at Jesus. So this means this religious group of people would be confessing, they would be admitting that Jesus outranks them, and not just by a little bit. He outranks them significantly because he is the Messiah. Either way they answer, they're not going to get what they want. Remember, they want to silence Jesus. They want him out of the picture. But as it turns out, Jesus is the smartest man who's ever lived. What I think is striking here is that they don't really seem concerned as they're debating back and forth what the right answer is. Not once does one of these guys say, okay, what do the scriptures say? 
They do not seem very concerned about what honors God. They actually don't seem very concerned about anything other than themselves and their reputation in this moment. They see two bad options, because either way, they lose the approval of the people. Again, they are not concerned with what is right, just what affects them. This is a fake religion on display. Real faith would be so much more concerned with what God wants. What would honor God? What would glorify God? Which decision could I make that would lift His name up? I mean, didn't we just receive a warning in the last chapter not to take the holiness of God so lightly? The chief priests, the scribes, the elders, they would have had so much say as to what goes on in the temple. The design and the purpose of their roles were to be men who, yes, had authority, but not just for the sake of having authority. Their authority was to teach and to show what was good according to Scripture, what was honoring to God. Their authority wasn't supposed to be about themselves, to build up their own reputation. Their job description was not to be liked. It was to lead people in right worship of the right God. It was not to say, hey, what could we say to give us the best poll ratings? No, their goal was to say, this is right according to the word of God. So we're going to do that because we want to honor God. We want to praise God with every ounce of our life. The question Jesus asked them is to expose this fake religion. John the Baptist was all about honoring God. The Jewish leaders were not. It's really as simple as that. God is not to be used. He's too big. He's too great. He's too awesome to be a means to an end. He is the creator and sustainer of all. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And how dare we or anyone else try to use him like a genie in the bottle to get what we want? When studying the Bible, I think it's helpful for us to ask, what does this teach me about following Jesus? Is there an example to follow? Is there a command to obey? Is there a promise to claim? Is there a sin to avoid? And in this passage, there is certainly a sin to avoid. Choosing what you want over what is right. That is a sin. Because James chapter 4 verse 17 says, quote, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. End quote. Now, I know there are hard to understand passages in the Bible. There are things that are wrapped in mystery, wrapped in, in so much like biblical context that we have to peel back the layers to really get at the heart of what's going on. But when James says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, that it's sin, that's about as black and white, cut and dry as it's going to get. The right thing is still the right thing, even if I don't get what I want. Even if it doesn't make me happy in the end, the right thing is still the right thing. It actually gets tougher than that. The right thing is still the right thing, even if it costs me something. Listen, refusing to gossip may cost you something. Refusing to go along with a plan you know is wrong or immoral may cost you something. Refusing to be like everyone else in this culture may cost you something. I know sometimes those things can be really hard and really difficult to fight against, but honoring God is more important than what I may miss out on or lose. As the people of God, our chief concern should always be to honor God. He is and will forever be worth all that we are and all that we have. So the religious leaders were not very good at consistency. They were not very good at demonstrating righteousness, and they were definitely not good at demonstrating righteousness consistently. Jesus, on the other hand, has always been a master of both consistency and righteousness. Every word, every action, every thought, every motivation that the Son of God has ever had, has, or will ever have is wrapped in righteousness. It is righteousness personified for us. He is, as Hebrews tells us, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if that's not consistency, I'm not sure what the word means. Here in a moment, we're going to read verse 9. And in verse 9, we're going to find out that Jesus is going to tell this group of people a parable. Now, I want you to understand something very clearly. He is preaching to the people. But though he is preaching to the normal, everyday people, it is about the religious leaders, the scribes, the chief priests, the elders, that he just had a conversation with. And this is going to be pretty obvious, because it's not going to escape the attention of the religious leaders. In the verse after today's parable, Luke writes this, this is verse 19, quote, The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people, end quote. At the end of this parable, they will be willing to lay hands on Jesus. They are furious with him. They are not liking what he has to say. This parable that we're about to go through has characters. And I think as we read through the parable, it's going to be helpful for you to understand who all the characters are. So let's do a quick run through the cast. Okay, so the man is God the Father. The tenants are the religious leaders. So you're talking about the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, etc., The servants here are prophets in the Old Testament. 
And the setting is a vineyard, which is an Old Testament image for Israel or God's kingdom. So we have God the Father as the man. We have the tenants being the religious leaders. We have the prophets of the Old Testament being the servants. And we have Israel being the vineyard. Okay? So our next point of the day is God has faithfully sent us many words of warning. God has faithfully sent us many words of warning. Starting in verse 9, quote, And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants, and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants, so that they would give him some of the fruits of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third, this one they also wounded and cast out." So track with this. God planted, he created a nation, a kingdom. It was God who made possible for 100-year-old Abraham and 90-year-old Sarah to have baby Isaac. That's where God's kingdom started. God is the one who rescued Israel from Egypt and the plagues and parting the Red Sea. God is the one who fed his people in the wilderness, who gave them victory in countless battles, who sent judges to deliver them from so many enemies, who used kings and empires to bring Israel home after their time in exile. God did all of that, all of it, every last bit. He gets full credit. There is no one else who should be listed on the credits after this movie. It was God doing it all. The people, if anything, were really working against God. He should get full credit for there being a vineyard, for being a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. He planted it. He owns it. I mean, look at Psalm 24, verse 1, quote, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, end quote. I know this is a hard thing for us to remember. God owns it all, and he has every right to say what the rules are. Though he has every right to do whatever he wants, he has chosen to make the rules in a way that actually lead to our joy and good. Yet, we always think we know better. So along the way, he used religious leaders to spiritually care for the nation, to help out the people he planted. But those who were supposed to care for the people really just led them astray, the blind leading the blind. So God sent prophet after prophet warning of what was to come. But they wouldn't listen to any of the prophets. They treated them shamefully. If you go to the Old Testament, You'll find Elijah had to flee for his life. Jeremiah was constantly ridiculed. And Isaiah didn't fare much better. In fact, scholars believe that when you get to the Hall of Faith found in the book of Hebrews, and you see a reference to someone being sawn in two, a lot of Bible scholars think that was Isaiah being sawn in two. In the New Testament, John the Baptist was beheaded. Those in power did not like the prophets. They didn't want God telling them what they should or should not do. They wanted to be Lord over their own life. They wanted to rule the vineyard that God had planted and gave them and charged them to watch over. No matter how many warnings came along, no matter which prophet it was, the people did not take those warnings seriously. And as a result, honestly, they caused themselves so much pain and so much anguish time and time again. We should always take the warnings of the Bible seriously. Listen, one lesson we can learn from the people of Israel, you can always choose your sin, but you can never choose your consequence. Let me say that again. You can always choose your sin, but you can never choose your consequence. Let's go to our next point. God has faithfully sent us his only son. God has faithfully sent us his only son. Now we're going to continue the parable that Jesus is telling, but we're going to get a new character in this parable, and I think you're going to be able to figure out who that is. Starting in verse 13, quote, Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. End quote. When the father asked, what shall I do? He's not confused. He's not given a wily coyote impression going back to the drawing board after another failed roadrunner plan. This what shall I do is more of a how much more can I do? I've given them word after word after word. And the answer to that rhetorical statement is to go all in. And how much more can he go all in than to send his beloved son the way the verses flow, you just can't help but think of John 3, 16, quote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, 
End quote. At any point in the story, wrath could have been poured down and it would have been right and just. But instead of wrath, God offered mercy. He proved His love by sending the Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, His beloved Son, so that whoever believes the beloved Son could escape the wrath of judgment and be saved, could have eternal life. Hebrews 2 verse 3 says, quote, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? End quote. This was their chance. This was their opportunity. This was the only lifeboat on a sinking ship. Hebrews ask, if we were offered this great salvation and we turn it down, then how will we escape the wrath to come? The ship is sinking. But what happens in this parable? They rejected the Son and they neglected the great salvation. They killed the Son, just like they would kill Jesus a few days later. So then, what happens after rejecting the only hope? Judgment comes. Verse 16 said, quote, He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not, end quote. Something about this feels like this moment was tense. You don't get a lot of feedback during Jesus' parables if you read through the Gospels. It's almost like the whole crowd understands that God's judgment is coming, like a collective gasp happens. His just and right judgment destroys. It's not a slap on the wrist. It's not a timeout. It is a total and complete destruction, and that is exactly what sin deserves. Look, I want you to understand something. God brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. He brought intense judgment. He wiped them off the face of the earth so thoroughly that archaeologists believe these were made up places. They didn't really exist. It wasn't until they dug up another city that found trade records with a city named Sodom that they understood these places really existed. But understand, the sin that was in those places deserved such a high level of wrath from God that he wiped them off the face of the earth that archaeologists could never discover them again until they found trade records in another city far away. His just and right judgment destroys. But look at the grace that preceded it. Warning after warning from prophets after prophet, the Son Himself comes to make peace. This is a lot of rejection before judgment came. If you're driving down the road and you see a warning sign that says, Bridge out ahead, but you keep going, and then you see another sign that says, Bridge out ahead, maybe it has an exclamation point, but you just keep going till you see one more sign that says, Bridge out ahead, and you keep going. Finally, you come to this line of traffic cones with a sign in the middle of the road that says, Bridge bridge out, and you just plow right through, ignoring every warning sign only to find out the signs were right. The bridge is out, but now it's too late. See, you are not guaranteed another warning. When the people gasped and said, surely not, Jesus responds in verse 17 and 18, quote, but he looked directly at them. What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. End quote. Remember what we said about taking warning seriously. Jesus is talking about real consequences here. Jesus leans in and he quotes from Psalm 118 verse 22. Now I want to give you the rest of the context in this passage. Psalm 118 verses 19 through 24 reads like this, quote, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. End quote. Jesus is the cornerstone. And in that passage, we see the cornerstone stone as the foundation to the gates of righteousness, the way of salvation. The hope they were looking for is here before their very eyes. But letting that gate close, neglecting the great salvation brings only brokenness. Whether you fall or the stone falls on you, it only leads to brokenness. Jesus looks directly at them as a clear sign. You've got to get this right. Literally nothing else could ever matter more than this in this moment. Your eternity is hanging on the balance. Will you reject the Son or will you receive the Son? Will you receive the Son and walk through the gates of righteousness and salvation He has prepared for you? Or will you let the gate shut, having to pay for your own sins in an eternity in hell? We see so much of the heart of God that in the final days of Jesus' life, He stands there. He proclaims the hope of the gospel, giving them one more chance to repent, to believe, to receive the Son, and find the life that God has for them. 
We have seen in this passage that God is faithful. God has faithfully demonstrated righteousness, showing that Jesus, the righteous one, is a high bar that not even the religious leaders could match up to. And if they can't match up to his righteousness, what hope do we have? We've seen that God has faithfully sent us many words of warning. Time after time, he has said, repent and believe, repent and believe, repent and believe. But for so many, we just keep driving, we keep driving, we ignore the signs. And then at the very end, we see that God has faithfully sent us his only son, that though there is no way we could make for ourselves to find ourselves in the kingdom of God, God, for God so loved the world, he has faithfully sent us his only son, that if we believe in him, then we can escape the wrath to come. We can get on that lifeboat from this sinking ship we find ourselves on. We can find the salvation that he has called us to, that he has prepared for us, that he delights in us finding. Don't wait. Thanks for listening to the Steadfast Podcast. I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul wrote this, quote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, end quote. So in light of biblical truth, let us be steadfast, immovable. Let us remember that through Jesus, not one labor is in vain, not one trial is in vain, not one effort in all of our lives is in vain. Because he gives purpose. And that purpose rings through eternity. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you've got questions you would like answered, you can email me at matt at steadfastpodcast.com.